For over 3,000 years of recorded human history, there has been an endless, ongoing war for dominance over the sea. Relying on the oceans for fishing, trade, and to transport armies for an invasion, destroying an enemy fleet to protect one's own maritime interests was often key to victory and nearly all the great empires of history built large fleets of ships to wage war. At first, naval battles were fought with ships charging at one another so their crews could engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. However, the invention of gunpowder meant weapons could now be launched at ever greater distances, until with the advent of rocket technology, these distances increased to many miles. Today, Warships carry anti-ship missiles capable of firing at targets over the horizon, far beyond what anyone on board the launch vessel can see, and with powerful warheads, just one hit is capable of sending the largest warship to the bottom of the ocean. Anti-ship missiles emerged from the many technologies developed during the Second World War, and as they matured and became more viable as weapons, they began to finally replace the guns that had for so long served the world's fleets. In today's episode, we're going to explore the events surrounding the first use of a guided missile in ship-to-ship -ship combat. This is the story of the sinking of the Israeli destroyer, Eilat. Welcome to Wars of the World. Since its birth on May 14, 1948, the Jewish state of Israel has been at odds with many of its Arab neighbors. Almost immediately, an Arab coalition attempted to destroy the small country in the first Arab-Israeli war, fought as a result of tension over the division of Palestine and the creation of the Jewish state. Even after the conflict formally ended, skirmishes along the Israeli border were commonplace, particularly with Egypt. This led to Israel conspiring with the United Kingdom and France in 1956 to manufacture a conflict between the opposing neighbors that could serve as a pretext to an Anglo-French intervention in the Suez Canal Zone, which Egyptian President Nasser had recently nationalized, damaging British and French post-war economic recovery. The plan ultimately failed due to American opposition to the operation and only further inflamed the situation regarding Arab relations with the Jewish state. In the years after the Suez Crisis, the animosity between the two sides only grew, leading to a period in Israel where the population lived under constant fear of a massive Arab invasion, which their relatively small armed forces would struggle to resist. Those fears appeared to be realized when Syrian-backed guerrillas began launching raids into Israeli territory, forcing Israeli forces to respond. This led to a major engagement on April 7, 1967, between Israeli aircraft and the Syrian Air Force over Mount Heron, in which six Syrian MiGs were shot down. Following the clash, President Nasser offered to support Syria if Israel attacked Syrian territory and dispatched troops into the Sinai, expelling UN peacekeepers in the region. He also barred Israeli shipping from entering the Straits of Tehran, a vital sea passage connecting the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba, in addition to signing a mutual defense pact with Jordan. A new Arab coalition was forming, and Israel felt threatened by it. Observing the deteriorating situation, Western leaders attempted to help resolve the situation peacefully, but Egypt's main ally at this time, the Soviet Union, provided inaccurate intelligence to Nasser that appeared to show Israel amassing troops on its northern border. With both sides convinced there would be war, there seemed no turning back, and the only question was who would strike first. Many expected it would be the Arab coalition, but realizing this would be disastrous, Israeli leaders elected to launch a preemptive strike. On June 5, 1967, 
Over 200 Israeli aircraft participated in Operation Focus, striking out over the Mediterranean before attacking Egypt from the north, bypassing the bulk of Egyptian defenses in the east of the country facing Israel. For days leading up to the attack, the Egyptians had launched large armadas of fighters in the early hours of the morning, in anticipation of the traditional dawn attack. Observing these aircraft, the Israelis timed their actual attack to coincide with most of the Egyptian planes returning to base to refuel, and as such, much of the Egyptian air force was caught on the ground, almost 90% of them being destroyed before they could get in the air. These airstrikes were then expanded to include Jordan, Syria, and Iraq, but with Egypt's air force out of the fight, the Israelis quickly achieved air supremacy. This allowed Israeli armor and infantry to storm into Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula. Equipped with upgraded American Shermans and British-supplied Centurion tanks, and having been trained by Western forces experienced in tank warfare from World War II, the Israelis swept away almost all opposition before them. On June 7, 1967, Israel captured the city of Old Jerusalem, and the Jewish troops celebrated by praying at the Western Wall. On June 9th, Israeli forces blasted their way through their northern border into Syria, capturing the Golan Heights before a UN-brokered ceasefire ended the fighting. Now remembered as the Six-Day War, the short but brutal conflict saw the Arab nations suffer 20,000 dead, as well as significant territorial losses, which Israel refused to give up in the peace. In what many Arabs viewed as a dishonorable sneak attack by the Jewish state, Israel had secured its existence in the immediate period, but the Arab states vowed revenge, and skirmishes, as well as terrorism, continued to dog Israel following the formal end to the fighting. While the Israeli Air Force and Army were lauded for their performance during the Six-Day War, the Israeli naval contribution was not so spectacular. While predominantly focused on protecting Israel's coastline and shipping lanes from attack, although Arab naval actions were limited during the fighting, assaults carried out on the Sinai Peninsula by naval commandos largely failed. Probably the most successful operation the Navy undertook was the capture of Sharm el-Sheikh on the southern tip of the peninsula this being the second time Israeli forces had occupied the area, having briefly done so during the 1956 Suez Crisis. Regardless, the Israeli Navy ended the war feeling like it was the weakest branch of the Israeli armed forces, and morale was much lower than in the Army and Air Force, who were basking in the glory of their campaigns. A major problem for the Israeli Navy was its rapidly aging equipment, much of which was acquired in haste during the country's early days in an effort to have any kind of navy. Thus, by the time of the Six-Day War, the service was going through a transitory phase as it sought to modernize in the face of growing technological capabilities of rival Arab navies, thanks to them receiving Soviet support. Typifying Moscow's military assistance to Israel's enemies was the Koma-class fast attack boats, which, displacing a mere 85 tons and capable of 30 knots, were extremely difficult targets to hit, but it was in their firepower that their true potential could be appreciated. Traditionally, such fast attack craft were armed with torpedoes, which required them to get in close to take aim and launch them, and even then, there was always the possibility of the target evading them. Now, however, the torpedo tubes were gone and replaced by large bins housing P-20 Termid missiles. Known in the West as the SSN-2B Styx, these weapons were not much smaller than a Kessner light aircraft and could fly at nearly supersonic speeds out to a theoretical range of 40 kilometers, delivering a devastating 1,001 pound warhead onto a target vessel. By contrast, the Israeli Navy was still operating a number of World War II-era torpedo boats and destroyers with their increasingly outdated anti-aircraft guns. One such destroyer was the INS Eilert, a British Z-class destroyer originally built in 1944 as HMS Zealous for the Royal Navy. Despite arriving late in the war against Nazi Germany, Zealous nonetheless saw extensive fighting in the North Sea intercepting Hitler's dwindling fleet of merchant ships as they attempted to deliver vital supplies from countries such as occupied Norway back home to Germany. 
Zealous also undertook Arctic convoy duties, protecting supplies traveling from the UK to Murmansk before participating in the liberation of Copenhagen. After a short but intense war, Zealous's post-war period was quite quiet, with long periods in reserve, despite being a relatively new ship, the war having afforded the Royal Navy a vast force of ships that were no longer needed. In 1955, it was decided to sell the vessel to the Israeli Navy for £35,000, who commissioned it into service as the INS Eilat, named after a city on Israel's southern coast. It seemed like there was barely time to replace the Union Jack with the Star of David when the Eilat was thrust into action during the Suez Crisis. Surviving that crisis and seeing use throughout the 1950s, by the mid-1960s, the ship was increasingly showing its age, and with the Israelis planning a major modernization program, its days of service appeared numbered, as did many of its contemporaries. Following the capture of the Sinai Peninsula in the Six-Day War, Israel's coastline now extended some 400 additional miles up to the Suez Canal, placing a greater burden on the Navy to maintain Israeli maritime integrity. The conflict might have officially ended, but the Egyptians made it clear that they were not about to give up their claim to the peninsula, and so with many of their countrymen killed in what they perceived as a cowardly sneak attack by Israel, many Egyptians were eager to get revenge. Knowing this, the Israeli Navy began patrolling the waters north of the peninsula, as well as undertaking freedom of navigation exercises in international waters near Egyptian territory. The intention was to discourage the Egyptians from making hostile moves against Israel via the sea, but it appeared to have the opposite effect, with the Israeli ships acting like red flags being waved in front of the Egyptian bull. On the evening of June 12, 1967, Barely two days after the end of the Six-Day War, the Eilat and two Israeli torpedo boats were manning a patrol station north of the now Israeli-occupied Sinai Peninsula, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Shoshan. Born in Belgium in 1930 to Polish parents, he survived the Holocaust before settling in the Holy Land, joining the newly formed Israeli Navy and being sent to study at a French naval college. By the mid-1960s, he was one of the most experienced commanders in the teenaged Israeli Navy. Suddenly, the destroyer's radar detected a small, high-speed target approaching from the vicinity of Port Said to the southwest. Believing the object to be an Egyptian Navy Komar-class missile boat, Shoshan ordered the torpedo boats to move on it, but as they did so, they realized that instead of a single Komar-class vessel, the radar had in fact detected a group of P-6 torpedo boats moving in close formation. Upon sighting the Israeli vessels, they altered course back to Port Said and the protection of shore-based artillery. But with the Eilat now without its high-speed escorts, two Egyptian torpedo boats used the coastline to hide them from Israeli radar and then make a dash to attack the destroyer, unaware that additional Israeli patrol boats were operating nearby. The Egyptians attacked, but were thwarted by the Israeli gunners, who managed to score hits on one of the P-6s, which was forced to turn away with its stern on fire. The Israeli torpedo boats going in pursuit, the Eilat attacked the remaining vessel. Sailing back into Egyptian waters, the P-6 crews must have thought they were safe, but instead found the Israelis continuing their pursuit until both were sunk with the loss of all on board before the Israelis sailed back to international waters. The incident was celebrated in Israel as yet another triumph of the Israeli military and helped restore some of the damaged pride of the Israeli Navy, but it only inflamed the situation in Egypt. The Eilat was now a ship well known to Egyptian sailors. On October 21st, 1967, the Eilat was again at sea and of Shoshan's 199 crew on board, roughly a quarter were trainees. Before setting off on the patrol of the Mediterranean, Shoshan had been informed by Israeli intelligence that they believed the Egyptians had learnt of the Israeli patrol routes and that a destroyer would be cruising north of Egyptian waters in the coming days. However, the patrol had thus far passed without incident, and that evening things seemed almost serene for the crew on board. Recounting later, Shoshan said, Visibility was still excellent. The houses of Port Said could be seen clearly on the horizon. We stood there, gazing at the sea, 
wanting to absorb the beauty and calm of the scene. However, the serenity was deceptive, for lurking in the Egyptian port's waters was one of the much feared Coma class missile boats, number 504, and it was hunting for an Israeli target. It was shortly before 1730 hours that 504 launched its two massive P-20 missiles from the bins on either side of the small vessel at a range of around 13.5 miles. On the stern of the Eilat, lookouts observed the small orbs of light appearing on the horizon, initially puzzled by what they were looking at before suspecting they had been fired at by unguided rocket artillery, such as the Soviet BM-21 system. Warnings were screamed up to the Eilat's bridge, and the destroyer's crew began taking evasive action, but the orbs stayed low and continued to track them. Eilat's gunners responded by attempting to train their anti-aircraft guns on what were now obviously incoming missiles, but it would be in vain. The first missile struck the destroyer midship, and was immediately followed by the second one striking near the engine room, the subsequent blasts immobilizing the Israeli destroyer. Engulfed in smoke, flames, and charred and twisted metal, one crew member would later compare the scene on board following the hits as being akin to that of a vision of hell on Earth. Shoshan and his men began a frantic firefighting effort to save the ship, while a distress call was transmitted to any nearby Israeli vessel or aircraft that could help. The missiles had struck near the ship's waterline, and the holes they had created when the warheads detonated saw water pour into the ship, causing it to begin listing heavily, although a frantic damage control effort appeared to be saving the ship from sinking completely. In Port Said, the Egyptians monitored the ship on their radar screens. It had stopped, indicating they had scored a successful hit, but they didn't know what state the Israeli vessel was in. Frustrated by its failure to sink, a second coma, number 501, was ordered to attack again, launching another salvo of missiles almost an hour after the first attack. One fell into the sea, but the other guided successfully to the crippled destroyer, striking the ship's stern. Having already sustained damage that would have sunk lesser ships, the Eilat was now finished, and the surviving crew manned their lifeboats before the gutted and holed destroyer slipped beneath the waves. The survivors were rescued by Israeli ships arriving on scene, the effort being hurried for fear of follow-up missile attacks, which the Israelis appeared defenseless to stop. But fortunately, the Egyptians decided not to attack the rescue force. Out of the ship's company of 199 officers, crew, and trainees, 47 were killed, while many others, including Shoshan, were badly injured. The Egyptian Navy, meanwhile, celebrated making history. In Israel, there was widespread anger over the sinking, not just aimed at Egypt, but at the Israeli government for allowing this to happen. The euphoria of victory in the Six-Day War had left the Israelis feeling that their military was unstoppable, and yet that feeling had now been smashed, just as an ongoing, undeclared war between Israel and its neighbors was ramping up, which Israelis would remember forever after as the War of Attrition. In the short term, Israel retaliated by bombarding Egyptian oil factories near the Suez Canal, severely damaging Egyptian oil production, showing their support to their Arab ally. Soviet ships began making so-called courtesy calls to Egyptian ports in an effort to discourage further Israeli attacks. But of course, this only pushed Washington to increase its aid to Israel. The attack on the Eilat also accelerated the Israeli Navy's modernization program, switching from old destroyers to smaller, more advanced corvettes and missile boats. Military observers around the world drew different conclusions from the Eilat's sinking. Some saw the incident as sounding the death knell for cruisers and destroyers, similar to how submarines and aircraft ended the days of the battleship. The counter-argument, of course, was that the Eilat was over 20 years old and lacked modern defensive weaponry, such as guided surface-to-air missiles that were being fitted to NATO and Soviet ships, as well as Israel. Several navies, such as Sweden, saw their future predominantly in smaller, missile-armed, fast-attack types. But while effective for defense, these were of little use to the major naval players, such as the US, the Soviet Union, France, and the United Kingdom, as they lacked the range and versatility necessary 
for their global operations. Consequently, a great deal of effort went into developing countermeasures to anti-ship missiles, resulting in a number of weapon systems, such as the Phalanx gun, designed to destroy them before they can hit the ship. Additionally, naval engineers have also developed electronic countermeasures, the idea being to jam the guidance systems of these weapons. Nevertheless, no measures taken by any navy appears 100% effective, and to this day, anti-ship missiles remain one of the deadliest threats to any surface warship, and with the advent of sea-skimming hypersonic missiles, their lethality only appears to be growing. And there you have the tale of the sinking of INS Eilert. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.